work for Dell. I'm also an OpenStack Foundation board member, which is where I was yesterday. Um, and I will, this is, this is meant to be interactive and a discussion. Um, so we're gonna tee things up for that. Um, so please, we have a lot of microphones. I, I want this to, to be something where we can all collaborate and discuss things. Um, because I will tell you that while I am an enthusiast for both quantum and fog, uh, I am not a deep expert in either, uh, and the, that's actually the rationale for this discussion. Um, so let me, go, I'll go, so you see the etherpads if I do it? Oh, that's cool. Huh. Uh, if you're not used to etherpads, uh, it'll be obvious as we go, um, but I did tweet an etherpad for this session so that we can take notes and, and do some collaboration because my goal here is really to ask questions and then entertain some discussion. Okay. Um, maybe have some fun. There, we'll see. Uh, Yay, okay. Uh, <laughs> quantum fog is a physics term, uh, and it's, it's a conglomeration of quantum, OpenStack quantum, which is our network abstraction and APIs, and fog, which is a um, abstraction layer for programming against multiple clouds. We will talk about what those things. This is the physics definition of quantum fog. Uh, and more simply, fog IO, which is the project, is an abstraction layer. Uh, and we'll talk about some of the use cases. How many people are familiar with FOG? So I'd, I'd have to know whether I define this or not. Aha. Okay, FOG is a class of API abstraction uh, tools, uh, JClouds being another one. Um, there's, there's some in almost every single language. FOG is one for Ruby, which is actually what the next slide is showing. Um, for Ruby to allow applications that want to program against the OpenStack APIs to be able to abstract the APIs, not have to deal with REST calls, but deal with semantic objects like servers and networks and things like that. So there are a lot of tools in the marketplace, if they're based on Ruby or Rails, that use FOG as the abstraction layer. And then the interesting thing about FOG as an abstraction layer is it's not limited to OpenStack. FOG is a generic and existed before OpenStack. It's a generic API shim that allows you to talk to Amazon or VMware or Joyent or whatever clouds you happen to, or Rackspace before they were OpenStack enabled. Um, and that's really the benefit with this. So if you program your program, if you're writing in, in Ruby, then your application can be hybrid cloud or multi-cloud, depending on how you define those terms, uh, and take advantage of that. Um, Right, fog, fog handles the abstractions. So the fact that Rackspace and HP's uh, public clouds are different is handled as an abstraction, right? The fact that an OpenStack uh, deployment might have differences in how it's deployed, you would do that. Um, the reason I wanted to do this talk uh, goes back to an email thread that Dan Went and I were having on the OpenStack mailing list about the, the dilemma and this, this is operative to this discussion about the dilemma between uh, uh, Nova networking and quantum, right? My team had actually done some work to see if we could bring some of the work in quantum back into Nova networking. That was not greeted with much enthusiasm on the list. Um, and it really came back to a migration challenge, right? We've, we've, people understand how to use Nova. They understand how to use Nova networking. Quantum is something new. Right? And so the question really comes back to not how do we make Nova networking more robust, but how do we encourage people to migrate and to start using Nova networking, or, or sorry, using quantum instead of Nova networking. And that's really the operative question, right? That is really the thing that I'm hoping we'll discuss and the, the thing that we need everybody's perspective on is what things can we do as a community to help people embrace this new networking API and, and make things easier. And so the thing I cho chose was fog, 
because it's used in the tool, the tool chains that I use, right? It's used in Chef, it's used in Puppet, it's used um, by our partners like Morph Labs who've, who've used it as an API layer to address OpenStack. Um, it's used in our own product. Right? We just uh, created a, a fog bar clamp so that you could look at the API of the OpenStack deployment that you just did. Um, all those things are really powerful ways to start leveraging OpenStack. Uh, and so we're, we'll, walk, we'll walk through this. Uh, I have absolutely want you to interrupt me and, and ask questions. And if I say something that seems wrong or you want to challenge, please do. That's how, that's, that's what the point is here, right? I, I want people's feedback and how they use it. How many people use Fog today? Not that many. Okay. So this is going to end up being a Fog sales pitch. That's good. Okay. That's fine. And so, um, Okay, and this is what I this is what I've been talking about. Um, so, when when we look at what we're doing with quantum, and what we we look at what we're trying to do, uh, a lot of a lot of the audience I was I was thinking we would have would be about somebody who's already using Fog, right? Who's using Nova, and and this is this is really what the story is. And even if you use if you say, hey, this is great, I want to use Fog, do people? Show of hands, do people understand what I'm saying about the use case for Fog at this point? Should I spend some more time talking about it? All right. um, I have a slide for that. Let me slip, slip forward. Yay. Okay. Um, so what do we want Fog to do? I'm, I'm, this, is, this is specific sort of the quantum Fog pieces, but let me talk about this in the case of Fog. So here's, here's our use case. You want to use OpenStack, otherwise you wouldn't be sitting in the room, and more importantly, you want to build automation in front of OpenStack, right? So that automation might be something like DevOps tooling to help you do a deployment and help manage a broad infrastructure where you're deploying a lot of servers. That's great. You might choose to also write an API shim layer in front of OpenStack so that you have a dashboard for your company, right? I've seen a lot of our customers choose to write um, a replacement for Horizon. They want to simplify things. They, they want to integrate it into their tooling. Or you might already have enterprise tooling where it would be really helpful to show uh, what was going on in your Nova compute infrastructure. So for example, you might have um, already gotten something where you want to list the number of VMs or do a chargeback system. Or you want to help, uh, you have an automated system where somebody can request a virtual machine. We see a lot of customers like this. They already have a way, like a help desk system, like Remedy or something like that, where a customer can say, I need a virtual machine, and it goes off and does the work or creates a trouble ticket or something like that. If you already have that, giving somebody a dashboard is great, but it doesn't really help you with the trouble, the, the ticketing system. So that's where people would use Fog. They would take Fog, they would put it in front of their ticketing system, and then they would it would allow them to then create a virtual machine and return, hey, here's the, here's the information for your virtual machine, and now you can go use it. So that, does that help clarify the use case? If you're doing DevOps deployments with Puppet or Chef, both of which use Fog, then being able to use quant, being able to use Fog is, is embedded in those tool chains. Okay, so you might be using Fog and not even be aware that that's the underlying mechanism for this. And if, so if you're in that case, then what I'm going to talk about is really significant because what's happening behind the scenes is your tool chains do not take advantage of quantum in, and is, are not helping migrate you into the next, um, next ra range of infrastructure. So if you wanted to deploy quantum, you'd want to make sure that the tool chains you're using are actually taking advantage of that. Okay. People have any other use cases for FOG besides ones I'm... I'm Anybody here trying to build an application in the ecosystem using Ruby or Rails? Is that a, excellent, okay. So that's, that's the point with this. And what we want to be able to do is, is, is collaborate together and figure out what that needs to do. Uh, right, you're gonna have to match Horizon, you're gonna have to do transparent things. Horizon, of course, is Django and, and Python. Um, you know, there's no reason that if you're comfortable with Rails and Ruby, then you wouldn't, you shouldn't be doing that. Different people have different needs for doing it. We could have the same talk for the Java-based API layer 
We could do other things. Uh, for us, we do a lot of Ruby, so this is a very natural fit. Okay, so let me go backwards. So the, the challenge here with, with looking at fog and what we want to accomplish with, with fog and quantum fog is that we want to make sure that we're building, that we have uh, the tooling that we do builds into our workflows, right? I don't want to tell you to go program against the REST APIs for OpenStack. While that works, you're duplicating a lot of effort. Um, at the OpenStack meetup, we had somebody who chose to do that for fun, which is great, but it took him a couple of weeks to get it all working and debugged and tested. And if you use FOG or some one of the other shims, you don't, you don't have to do that. And you can leverage the API changes. You don't have to reinvent your application if somebody changes the APIs. Um, and so one of, the, one of the tricks here is that you know, we really want to think about what's going to help people move to quantum. Okay? And so if you're, if you're looking at quantum, how many people are going to deploy OpenStack with quantum now that it's core in the system? Wow. Nothing. How many people are using Nova Network? for deployments. See, a lot of people are doing both, which is actually one of our core use cases for this. Um, so here's, here's the deal. If, especially if you're, if you're doing both, or even if you're just doing one, the idea, and, and this is one of my concerns with quantum, why well, I'm, I'm very enthusiastic about it, I'm, I'm also concerned that it's adding another barrier, or back to barrier to adoption, um, for customers who want to use quantum but don't really know how to do all the quantum work, right? So if you're going to set up a new virtual machine and you want to attach it, um, and I'm not going to, I'm not, my goal here was not to train you on quantum, but if, if I want to build a network and attach a port to it and then attach the VM to the port so that I have network communication, I need to do all those things to get my virtual machine working in quantum, then I need a way to make that all sort of transparent, right? If you're dealing with customers or users who are trying to adopt the cloud, if you present a barrier where it's not only that you have to get a virtual machine, you also now have to know which networks you're going to connect it up to, we're adding complexity. We're not, we're not necessarily helping our, our users adopt OpenStack. So that's a lot of what we're trying to do. Um, and at the same time, we're trying to help people. If you're using the old Nova networking, the current Nova networking, and you, know, you want to bring in quantum, you want to be able to help people with the transition. Questions? Does that make sense? I'm, I, I, I need nods back from people so that I can, not sleeping nods, but nods. Um, okay. And then, and then there's another major question in, in this, which is really interesting, um, and hopefully we'll get to, um, which is if we embed quantum, how does that impact Amazon? How does it, right? Fog is, is designed to be able to be used against an Amazon cloud or a VMware cloud. That's one of the benefits. So one of the questions that I have for the audience, for everybody here, is can we, you know, in, you know how do we cope with the compatibility issues, right? A lot of what Fog does is very straightforward. I need a VM. I need, a, you know, I need to boot it. I need to shut it down. Basic operations. They don't really talk about how you build a network and how that translates into Amazon clouds or, or VMware's clouds. All right. Um, when I submitted this talk, there wasn't a quantum, or I wasn't aware of a quantum fog. There is now fog, quantum fog, um, CRUD, create, uh, read, update, uh, delete capabilities. Um, and Fernand, you're, I don't think he's here. No. Um, but this, is, this came in a couple weeks ago. Um, so today with Fog, you can go in and you can actually do the basic operations, right? Uh, this is great because I didn't want to have to work to get this done. Um, but the, you know, the code is pretty straightforward. It, it uses the quantum API to create a network, create a port, attach a, attach a server to a network and a port, right? CRUD, uh, the basic operations. Um, it's not what I wanted to talk about. So having this done is, makes things easier. This, this is the question I was asking. I'm going to skip forward to that. That's a quantum fogger, by the way. I didn't even know one existed. It's amazing. Um, so th this is, these are the operative questions uh, to me that I came up with. And there's probably some more, and I'm hoping you'll, you'll come back with these. Um, 
this is this is cool. Quantum this, in the background, this is aerogel, which NASA invented to collect stardust. It's really cool. Conversion between physics and cloud. It's awesome. Um, so what what we've got here is uh, the first question I have is if we're going to try and do automatic behaviors. So if we're doing fog, right? Do people now understand pretty well what fog's going to do? Right. And now I've, we've talked about there's a, there's a fog API already for creating a network. We don't want that to go away. We need it. But if the systems do use, if you have a quantum enabled system, having a VM without a network doesn't make much sense. Should our default behavior be to connect a virtual machine to create a network, attach to the network, set up the port and make things go by default? Right. I'm looking at Matt because I know I can see Matt's thinking about it. I, well, it's right. I mean, this is this is my my purpose here is not to give the answer. I I don't know, right? There's there's a part of me that thinks that if we make these default behaviors in this in quantum fog, then it makes it easier to adopt, right? Obviously, you have to test if quantum exists in the cloud you're attaching to, then you, you want to do it. Mics. We can look at what Fog's already doing uh, with regards to storage, if anything, and what the overall breadth that we want Fog to, to be. Um, I haven't used Fog all that much, just used it to spin up a couple of Amazon machines and then repurposed it for the service provider that I was at, mm -hmm. so we could spin up service provider machines. But we never even really went into storage because we had a default storage that we were giving everybody. Correct. But, uh, the folks who are looking at Fog and storage now saying, oh, I want to be able to hook up LUNs and I want to be able to hook up, you know, larger or different kinds of storage devices and do storage failover. Can I look at object? Can I look at block storage? Um, the same kind of questions come in on the network level and usually you'll have some sort of network management tool that's making these decisions or helping you make these decisions that you already have in place or wishing you were had in place. Um, same with storage. So, you know, my recommendation would just keep fog super simple. And that's, I, I think that that's a valid answer, right? If Fog only does the CRUD operations, then it's, you, you've got the access to the underlying systems, right? And storage, we don't have the storage pieces right now. We have to get the Cinder APIs in place and have Fog adapted to Cinder and, and do those things. Um, anybody have a, a, a response or a comment on that before I keep going on the? Do we have another mic? I know there's two mics. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> knowing how uh, Nova Networks is pl uh, planned to be completely gone at some point, um, mm -hmm. I think the second bullet allows switching between Nova and Quantum. Um, I would say no, uh, because the people who probably care the most about this are probably using Quantum. And I don't, I mean, unless you have a business reason to go and, and backport Nova networking support, I don't expect anyone to do it. But well, but my my thought on this is that Nova networking sort of works today, right? If if I deploy a virtual machine using Fog, it's going to attach to the networks that are default quantum networks. So I already have that behavior. So th the question is, do I then how much default behavior should I mimic? So if I switch to quantum, am I going to get the same default behavior to attach to the same networks? That that's my question, and I'm not. I, I just don't see a lot of value trying to, uh, I mean, the, the, the thing about fog mm -hmm. is the work that gets done is the work that people want. Like, there's nobody, none <laughs> of us in here is, like, paid to work on fog as our day job. Nobody is. I mean, you know, Wesley, uh, you know, he works on it some, but he has a day job. Right. And, you know, the people who contribute are solving, scratching their own itches. So we can, you know, talk about what we'd like to see, but if, if you want it, you're going to write it. <laughs> That's right. And if, if I, and you know, uh, from you know the chef viewpoint, we haven't gone into networking much yet. You know, I've, storage will probably come next uh, because someone will want it, and chances are good it will come because you know somebody has to have it, and they have a business reason. So we can talk, but you know, you know, it's fog. People are going to do what they want. And that which is which is the core use case. I I completely agree with you. I, I think 
from my perspective, there's an element of, is there, the, the reason I, I, I wanted this talk is, is there a way that we can take the existing Fog users and help them migrate to quantum? Is, right, is, is, are there things that we do as a community that encourage quantum adoption and make the transition easier? Um, having that default behavior mimic the old style of Nova network seems to me would be very beneficial, um, yeah. especially if they just have no experience with, you know, dealing with piecing together networks and things like that. Um, so to automatically, or, you know, obviously as an option, um, having an option there to say just automatically, you know, attach to a default network kind of thing and defining that default network. Um, that kind of thing would enable adoption. I would, you know, it's, it, it becomes less disruptive to adopt quantum at that point. You have to do less work. Um, so it eases the transition. Right. Is that, is that something that you think your customers would care about? Uh, no, I mean, would we care about it directly? Because, um, you know, it, the customers never see that in essence and hopefully never have to. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it probably to us doesn't matter. I mean, you know, we're pretty deep into the networking layer stuff anyway. So I don't think for us we would need it. But I could definitely see, you know, if you're trying to get into quantum, that would certainly ease the, the path. Right, and that's, this is, this is, so I'm, I'm trying to figure out because there's places where my team as an adoption, as assistance for adopters, you know, we're looking at places where we can contribute to FOG in a useful way. Right, and that's, I mean, that definitely comes to his point was, you know, unless someone has, um, you know, some reason to, to develop that feature, it's not going to be done. In general, with people that are, um, have their own agenda um, probably never get done because those that actually are using it to that extent and contributing back already know how to piece these things together and just don't need that default behavior. But um, if there's a third party that um, wants uh, quantum adopt more wi adopted more widely and is willing to put in some time to it, right. that would, in my mind, be an area that would you know benefit quantum adoption. Right. And that's, that's, that's part of the key. So, I mean, one of the questions back along those lines is how many people here would, are willing to invest in helping quantum adoption? Is that something that people care about in this audience? And it might not be. How many people are, would, if you were gonna deploy OpenStack, would you, would you use quantum instead of Nova networking at this point? Not that many, okay. Um, and, and this actually underscores where, where my, you were not, what was your, you were nodding? It's a huge, here's, here's, my, here's my concern, and this is sort of where Dan and I went back and forth, and the, I, I put in this talk specifically because I felt like there was no way to answer this, which is, you know, today, our customers are probably gonna deploy Nova Network, mm -hmm. and so we're gonna continue to have customers deploy Nova Network in the field. And, and I, that, that will probably not slow down Percentage-wise, it probably will, but for uh, this release, next release, right, probably on, on we're, you know, and I know, I know we want to deprecate Nova Network and, and transition people over. Um, the, the challenge is the more people deploy Nova Network today, and just based on the response I'm getting from the crowd, either you don't know or you're not that, you're not that committed to switching over to quantum, then you know, that transition is gonna become something we actually have to deal with. That the community who wants to deprecate this code needs to deal with, needs to provide off-ramps for Nova networking. Um, and so when I look at our customer base and our deploys and the things that are going, you know, we need to help our customers off-ramp. Um, and so that, that's why these questions to me are really important. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Can, we pass, can we pass the microphone? Oh, you're really loud. I, you, yeah, you might. Yeah, you <laughs> so in, in this discussion, there's kind of two aspects, right, that, that for us to follow. One is the quantum side, right? The, um, for Falk, one, one avenue is yeah, to help quantum adoption, which is one of the concerns you have. Um, right. It wants to be a quantum client. And what you want to do there is expose as many of the nooks and crannies and you know, special things about quantum in, in a Ruby API, and people totally. don't have to deal with all the rest. You know. Um, the other thing is that, that your first question goes more towards is what's kind of the network API model that FOG should expose 
And I don't think you can just say that, say, you know, would it be useful to do X, Y, Z by default? You really, if you want to do that, you want to make it as much of a cross-cloud API as possible, and you have to look at what the individual backends provide and how much abstraction you can, you can give people here. Um, you know, mm -hmm. that, and, and, and that, that, that's kind of, I mean, that, that's one so of the things that, that's kept us in the past from using Fog is that the cross-cloud abstraction is really not, not that strong, right? I mean, it's more an assort, uh, it's more a collection of clients, which mm -hmm. is, is very useful in its own right. Right. Um, but you know, the, the cross-cloud model is, is not as built out as it should be. So let me, let me turn that around as, a, as an additional question. So if, if Fog adds quantum API support, it is moving away from cross-cloud capabilities, right? Those, those API calls for quantum are not going to work against Amazon. They're not going to work against right. VMware. Yeah. So the, the, the value of Fog as a, as a, as a cross-cloud scripting platform are decreased. So how do you see us being able to keep, you know, what, what level of behavior should Fog exhibit on the least common denominator, which to me means automatic behavior, but what type of behavior do you see keeping, keeping that valuable? Um, I, I mean, you have to look at the different backends you want to, to provide. You can't, I mean, the, the, the cross-cloud API, if you, you know, if you want it to be useful, has mm -hmm. to, you know, really follow the, the kind of things that, that whatever you see as your main targets right. gives you. Um, and that means that some of the quantum things will probably not be, you know, not be exposed in that API. Yeah, I was going to say, does that assume that there's some automatic magic happening? Because that's what you're... Yeah, so some, of it, some of it will be automatic magic, so right? If, if you decide that, that for the cross-cloud API, the best thing is to, you know, because it fall, yeah, that's what the other things give you, and that's kind of the API model you want to, to, to pretend is there to, to use as is that there's automatically network created, then yes, that, you know, that's what you want to put in. And that might require a lot of gymnastics inside the library to actually make happen in each of the backends. Yeah, I think that's what, what Bob was saying was, uh, you know, um, having built and pushed policy and then, you know, from the client side and then the person in the middle of the call and ending up with the same result, whether it's no network, you know, AWS or whatever model you're using. Right? Or, or it could even be two public cloud providers, right? So if somebody's scripting against their managed private cloud, Right, then, then, and then you go to script against a OpenStack hosted cloud that doesn't support quantum, or do, maybe does actually, does. Not, more likely does support quantum, and your private cloud doesn't, or it's a VMware cloud, then yeah, this this behavior, right? That's that's key here. Right. That's, that's why the CRUD, to me, is not that interesting. Right. It's important. We have to have it. But, but it, it only helps somebody who's dedicated to using quantum, and it moves them further away from your point, which is that I'm now cross-compatible. So uh, boiling that back down, I think that we are looking at the need for some automatic behavior to make sure that if you do something non-quantum in FOG, that it works if it's quantum or Nova Network. And then ideally, it probably works if it's VMware or Amazon. Right? Compatibility or yeah. so, so, go ahead. Again, I, I think the point I was trying to get at was <coughs> you need to define the API, right? That's what drives these decisions. You need to define what the model is you're going to expose to users of Fog. Yeah, the, 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 the challenge is Fog is its own API already. So, you know, we don't want to necessarily add in. On, on the network front. Uh, on the right. network side, right. And, and I'm, I'm a big fan of, you know, you want abstractions. My, the phrase I always use, abstractions are really useful until they're not, which means basically that, and this is why I like, I like uh, Chef and what Chef does. It's like, hey, there's these great patterns and you can use them, but if you just have to take a hammer to something and install it, just sure, that's fine. It's built into the system. Um, and same thing with Ruby. You know, Ruby's a really good example of that. Use these conventions. They work. Until they don't, and then that's okay. Nobody gets upset, um, right? But that's the the challenge is, and this is what's what's weird about Fog, like any of these things, is they are themselves their own APIs, and the fact that a server object is a server object in Fog is is it's an it's a programming interface to server, and you can only extend it so far without breaking the 
uh, cross cloud capabilities. And at that point, we really have an open, you know, and the question, actually, here's, sorry? Well, at, at, at Mm -hmm. The whole idea of it being able to support multiple cloud or providers is that you don't have to program for them. Um, that's its point, right? That's, that's why you need something like that. Uh, so if it can't do that, then it loses a lot of its benefits. If I'm programming for AWS, VMware, whoever the hell else knows, um, the moment I have to do something different from one of the providers, it's no longer acting as a cloud provider, but acting as a cloud And, and that's one of, the, one of the things that I asked myself about when I first started trying to use Fog was, why don't we just have a Ruby uh, OpenStack library, right? Because at that, maybe, we sh maybe that's the right answer. And so, th and this, this is the subtlety between Fog, this being a Fog discussion and just being a Ruby OpenStack API discussion, which is, the purpose here is cross-cloud scripting. It is to be able to use, I mean, you guys used Fog for a reason, as opposed to just writing the direct APIs. Why, would, was that an objective for you, or is it? I'm going to ask you to identify yourself, oh, so the so the audience knows, and so you guys can actually get, get credit for the work you're, you've been doing. Hunter, uh, this is Hunter. He's a uh, director of development for Morph Labs, um, and has been his team has been contributing back a lot of the fog stuff. Um, so it's good. It's a it it does its job, and um, you know, like uh, someone said, you know, we add to it as needed, and. Um, uh, out of the SX support, uh, so. That's, so this is, you know, we're looking at where, I, I'm right, obviously, I'm from Dell, we're looking at where that we want to make investments in fog so that we can work for hybriding, we can work for adoption for quantum, those are important to us. Um, yeah, so that's when I mentioned uh, arbitrarily that third party that might, um, you know, put some time into making that abstraction layer a little more abstract, uh, certainly I was referencing Dell, and, you know, Dell probably has that motivation uh, to dedicate the resources to do that work potentially, um, because for them, it's adoption is the key, uh, so. Yeah. And, and one of the things that, that I, I actually, is worth discussing is that it's, this isn't um, especially worth it because of the, what the conference is and what it's about. And um, so one of the other things I do is I run the Austin OpenStack meetup groups. Um, and so it, it, is, uh, it, it happens that uh, Rackspace and the Rackspace cloud and HP and the HP cloud and Dell all come together in those meetings. And one of the things that we all agree is that having fog and you know, J clouds and, you know, and, and, and different APIs helps people with adoption. And we all have a motivation to help people adopt these types of technologies. So um, there's a lot of motivation for us to be a participant in that community um, and for the other, right, for the public clouds to all be uh, participants in the community because that's that drives us forward. Um, all right. Oh, good. Okay. So we've covered use cases. Um, transparency versus opaqueness was one of the things. So I'm, I'm because I'm, I'm planning to start doing some of this work, like Matt was saying, the way this stuff happens is when people do work and it shows up. Um, do people have a feeling for, op for op opacity versus transparency on, on this? Yeah, go ahead, Matt. It's, it's, 
float it back. So uh, Fog has a mailing list, uh, very low traffic. Um, it has an IRC channel, very low traffic. Uh, so I would say cross post to the Fog list and the OpenStack list saying, you know, here's what we plan on doing and probably, you know, Morph Labs and, you know, Ops Code and Puppet Labs will watch. <laughs> no, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. Or, or, you know, where, where appropriate, we'll, we'll uh, get involved. I mean, the uh, maintainers for the OpenStack provider are, you know, it's like Hunter and, and uh, uh, Todd Wiley and mm -hmm. Dan France. So uh, you could probably find all those guys here. Yeah, and that's, that I was hoping we would drive, we would drive the dialogue and, and have some of these discussions, right? Because like I said, I am not the, the fog king. That's not, that's not a role I've taken on. I'm, I'm really trying to figure out where you know, what we should be talking about with this and what, how we should be doing the designs. So yes, we'll definitely do that. Do you have a, do you have a thought from, from your experience on, on this? Uh, we're, we're fans of just-in-time development. <laughs> that's, that's a reasonable, no, it's, it's perfectly reasonable. Um, yeah, so um, I think we answered the, the, the last question, which is if we don't, we don't do generalized, we're not accomplishing the mission. So, um, which probably means more least common denominator, but at least you're providing some type of capabilities uh, with that. And this is, this is something where, um, you know, our goal is for people to be able to get the most value out of their OpenStack cloud as quickly as possible. So when I, sh when I show up to a customer site and say, hey, you can use Fog and start doing some scripting, it makes things easier, right? It allows us to do tests. It allows us to, to keep moving things forward. And that's probably the place, actually speaking of first use case and just-in-time development, the place where we'll see our adaptions, ad adoption and, and adaptations for FOG are probably in our, in our test environments and continuous development. So we want to be able to make those things work. Um, that is also quantum FOG. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. No, the, well, no, this isn't this isn't physics. Uh, there's a quantum. This this is hilarious. Have you seen this? The, the research. I, yeah. I don't I don't Google this stuff at at, at work. I take. <laughs> so yeah, there's a, there's a, a quantum spray that apparently they made alcohol small and then claimed that you could have a spray and it would be equivalent to three drinks. Uh, but I, uh, yeah, the disinfo.com is the site <laughs> to resolve it. The, this guy liked it. I don't know. Um, <laughs> exactly. That's, that's exactly the connection. Yes, waste. Uh, so, you know, one of the things that, that we want, and I think Matt's really underscoring this, is it, this comes back to applications, right? Are there, there, are there people in this room who are thinking through applications that they have for, for quantum fog that would actually be turning around and saying, all right, I think I get it. I want to, uh, you know, I can use fog if I need to do some type of, of you know, I have some use cases for fog. Is there, are there people in this room who would, who, after this session, turn around and say, hey, I, I actually want to collaborate on this. I want to, I want to work on quantum and fog abstractions. You want to talk through a use case? You. Cool. That's a, that's a really good use case for it. And would you consider quantum when you deploy OpenStack if you pick OpenStack? Yeah, I also I also pulled open a, a, a slide uh, presentation for comparing the, the differences in, in Nova Network versus quantum and trying to wrap my own head around it. Mm -hmm. And I've been coming to grips with the fact that you know we've got we've got uh, web VMs and database and app uh, segregated VLANs and Nova Network, which seems like a miserable trying to match that up. Sure. I cannot hop over the quantum slide and be like, oh, here's the, the load balancer VLAN, and here's 
all the back end right. here at the end, and it all kind of makes sense relative to what we do today. Uh, so I would, I would probably jump there as well. If, if you're doing Greenfield, go Quantum. The, the, the <laughs> yeah, yes, everybody's nodding. Uh, that message should be loud and clear. The, the challenge is quantum is, is going to be more complex. So we're, we're working to try and help people with the complexity for it. Um, and, and I know a lot of other people are, uh, but it's still, it's still there. And this is part of that, that attempt for us. Just So that's right. I mean, we're, we're, we're talking about things that really help people be, build abstractions that they can reuse across clouds and, and do that. And some of this, I think, and this is a, a whole other question a couple slides back, which is do we then try and push these changes into other cloud infrastructures, right? I know Amazon's not going to give you a lot of choices on which IPs you get, but VMware could give you a ton of choices on how you set up your virtual networks and how you connect things together and stuff like that. So, um, you know, at some point uh, we have to figure out that at least back, we're back to least common denominator as I go through that. Other people have use cases they want to talk about? Thank you for I sharing yours. It's good. Yeah. I have one that's, that's not quite an application. I'm, I'm the maintainer of Apache Delta Cloud. And what we're doing is okay. um, we build a RESTful APIs. What we started with kind of our, our own RESTful cross-cloud API. Um, we've added a DMTFCME, which is a, a s API standard and an EC2 front end. Um, and as part of what we're doing, we have all these backends that talk to different clouds. And I mean, over the years, I've talked to Wesley a few times. Good. Um, <laughs> the idea, yeah. We so had the so idea ac that actually, I want to pause you for a second and, and make sure that people understand, right? He's talking about the Java version. No, no Ruby. Oh, is it Ruby? Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm now. I'm now. I'm a little bit. So it's Delta also. De Delta Cloud is, in, in, is a Ruby. I thought um, it was okay. You're right. I'm thinking J, J Clouds. Yeah, Delta Cloud is Ruby. Yeah. I'm sorry. But yeah, no. So Delta Cloud, we're doing a RESTful API, right? Not an in-process API. Um, and you know, <coughs> what we would have loved, or what we would love to have, is that for all the backend stuff, we can just plug and talk and don't have you know, drivers for ah, EC2 okay. and OpenStack and whatnot. Um, and we've looked uh, and we've looked, and it's never been uh, Fog, the, the abstraction that, that Fog gives you and, and the cross cloud capabilities were never at the point where we were like, oh, we can throw away our, our stuff and just have one Fog back backend. Mm -hmm. It always looked like we would still have an EC2 backend, an OpenStack backend, a, a vSphere yeah. backend. And that, you know, then it was never clear that in, in the end it would be a net win. For us to, to switch to Fog. Although I, I would like, I mean, it makes a ton of sense. I, so it's it's th and this is, I still go back and forth, right? It's, it's very possible that the quantum, that to make quantum really effective, we cannot bend Fog enough to make, and that, that's, a, that's a possible outcome for this discussion, <laughs> is you know, that we can't bend Fog enough to make it really work well for the capabilities that quantum's enabled, um, and that the semantic definitions don't exist, and so. I, you know, th th this is part of, part of the purpose of this talk was if a lot of people had stood up and said, hey, we're using quantum, or we're using fog already, and we really care about migrating and we want to help mi hi migrate, that would be a different topic. That would be a different conversation. So I, I had no idea how, the, how you guys would respond. Actually, I've, I've enjoyed the conversation. Um, I think we're about at lunchtime. I have cookies up here if you want to. <laughs> they're, they're, uh, they're actually pretty tasty. They're Dell cookies. Um, they are Dell cookies, right there. You do know they don't stack like a Dell toaster stack. I bought that one, right? <laughs> same colors and same can underneath, but like cookies. Do the coasters taste good? No, but I see more money on toasters. 
So everybody, thank you for coming. I, I, I hope the format worked for you. This was, I was trying to, to drive a, a discussion. Um, and I hope to see you all online and, and, and helping build some of this cool technology and, and making things happen. So thank you all for coming. Enjoy lunch.